Welcome to this presentation, the series Electronics, the Story of One Human Lifetime, presented by David Beams and Gary James. I am David Beams, Associate Professor Emeritus of Electrical Engineering, at the University of Texas at Tyler. And this particular episode is entitled, We Get Mail. How does a graphic equalizer work? Well, what's a graphic equalizer and who wants to know? Now, in a former community college student from when I was an adjunct faculty member in the 1980s, got hold of me. Internet's easy enough to do. And he asked a question about using the Sanyo LA3600 graphic equalizer IC for compensating the frequency response of a crystal microphone for amateur radio purposes. Well, I'd never looked at a graphic equalizer before, so I had to do some investigation. What is it? It's a device for selectively altering the spectrum of an audio signal, amplifying or attenuating certain frequency ranges. It divides a frequency spectrum into bands. It allows signals with each band to be amplified or boosted or attenuated or cut independently of the others. This, for example, is a Behringer EQ700. It divides frequencies from 100 hertz to 6.4 kilohertz into seven octaves. An octave is a factor of two increase in frequency. So the first band is centered at 100 hertz, then 200, 400, 800, and so on. The boost or cut in each octave is determined by the position of a slider potentiometer with the center being zero decibels or unity. You can slide it up for boost or slide it down for a poor cut. This unit also has a master gain control or a level control. And its product description calls it a graphic equalizer guitar pedal. Now, I'm not a guitarist, so that's as much as I can say on the subject. But this is a rather simple device, but you can find like professional grade graphic equalizers multi-band graphic equalizers such as this Yamaha Q2031B that's shown in the picture. Well, let's take a look at the Sanyo LA3600. This is the application circuit of the Sanyo LA3600 in the data sheet. I want to point out some, some salient features here. It's designed for five bands centered at 108 hertz, 343 hertz, 1.08 kilohertz, etc. Now, each center frequency is a factor of 3.16 greater than the preceding one. 3.16 is the square root of 10. So after two bands, we have a decade in frequency from 108 hertz to 1.08, and then two bands later, we're at 10.8 kilohertz. Now, this is the bypass capacitor for the power supply pin, which the chip also labels as VCC. This is a bypass capacitor for a pin that's labeled the DC pin. Bypass capacitors hold these VCC pins and DC pins at ground potential for AC. That is, there's no time varying voltage at those pins. There can be DC potential, but no time varying voltage, no AC potential. We also have a DC blocking output capacitor, a DC blocking input capacitor. For purposes of our understanding the circuit, they're not terribly important. And we have here the boost cut potentiometers and these capacitors you see here are used for setting the frequency response of each band. We'll see how that works. One other thing to point out is this input resistor, 4.7K is the reason for that specific value, which will become parent here shortly. The equivalent circuit block diagram for this device from the data sheet is shown here. The main components are an op amp. And then you have five NPN transistors that are connected as emitter followers. Emitter follower is an amplifier circuit that has a gain of unity. Get into that in a little more detail later. But this pins here that are labeled base, those are the input of an emitter follower. And the pins that are labeled NF, those are the emitter follower outputs with a series 1.2K internal resistance. Okay. The output of an emitter follower is taken at the emitter, the input is at the base, 
but here they've added a 1.2k in series. So that also turns out to be important. So let's take a look at a basic gain that is boost or attenuation or cut circuit. And in this particular diagram, R1 is that input resistor and R4 is a 4.7k feedback resistor for the op amp, which is built into the chip. R2 and R3 will represent the slider potentiometer and R5 is a resistance from the wiper of that potentiometer back to ground. Now, let's see how this, let's get an idea how this circuit works. Let's label this node as V in. Let's label this node as VO. We'll label this node as V sub P. And we'll label these two nodes as both V sub A, which may sound a little funny, but what I'm doing here is I'm using the um, virtual ground principle of the op amp. When an op amp is connected with negative feedback, that is a conducting path from the output back to its inverting input, it will move its output voltage in such a way as to bring the input voltage differential very close to zero for all practical intents and purposes, zero. So these two nodes will be at the same potential and I'm labeling that potential V sub A. And I'm going to use notation here that G sub X is equal to one over R sub X. This is a conductance, this is resistance. So G four, for example, would be one over R four, G two would be one over R two, okay? so. Let's do Kirchhoff's current law at the op amp's non-inverting input and V in minus V a times the conductance G one is the current entering this node and that has to equal the current leaving, which is V a minus V p times G two. The op amp itself draws no current. The, at the inverting input, we have V out minus V a times G four equals VA minus V sub P times the conductance G3. And finally, one more equation at V sub P. We have V sub A minus V sub P times G2 plus G3 equals VP times G5. Okay, now solve those and we can find a relationship of V out to V in. And we did the math, so you don't have to. And here it is, the expression for the uh, ratio of the output voltage to the input voltage as a function of all those resistances. Now, let's repeat that gain equation. And let's assume now that R1 is R4, which is, we'll just call that R, which is the case in that design. Remember the input resistor, which was R1 in my representation, was a 4.7K and internal to the op amp was a 4.7K resistor between the output and the inverting input, which I've designated here as R4. So they're equal, and we'll just call their resistance R and the conductance G one over R. If we make that change, then this becomes the gain relationship of that circuit. Now let's try a few cases. Let's let R5 go to open. If R5 is an open circuit, its conductance is zero, and then the gain V out to V in becomes simply one, regardless of the values of R2 and R3. Well, let's let R2 equal R3, and we'll designate one over R2, which is also one over R3 in this case as G23. And under those circumstances, V out to V in is one independent of the value of R5. So. The voltage gain is always one if either R5 is open or if R2 equals R3. Let's repeat the gain equation here. Again, making the assumption that R1 and R4 are the same. Now let's assume that R2 goes to zero, which makes G2 infinite. And let's take the limit of this gain expression as G2 goes to infinity and we get this and it becomes simply R5 over R plus R5. Now, that has to be less than one. Now let's assume that R3 goes to zero. We'll let G3 then go to infinity and 
we get this expression, the voltage gain goes to R plus R5 over R5, that gain has to be greater than one. And notice that the minimum gain here and the maximum gain are reciprocals of each other. Okay, so let's do some simulation to verify these results. We're going to assume that R2 and R3 are parts of the same potentiometer, which makes the sum of R2 and R3 is constant. Let's use LT SPICE, freeware version of the industry standard circuit analysis package SPICE. Let's use LT SPICE to test the case that V out to V1 or V in is one independent of R5 if R2 and R3 are the same. Now just remember R1 and R4 are equal. I'm assuming that condition is true in all of these analyses. And running this simulation, the, the, the transfer function V out to V in calculated by LT SPICE for 150 ohms, 1500 ohm, and 15,000 ohms for R5, the voltage gain is one and it doesn't change. So that seems to work. Now let's try some cases where R2 is almost zero while R2 plus R3 is 100K. SPICE won't allow me to enter a value of zero for a resistor, but I can enter something like 0 0.001 ohms. So let's do that. And we expect under the, those cases, the voltage gain would go to R5 over R plus R5. So let's see if R5 is 1500 ohms, which is the nominal value I show here, we expect the gain to go to 1500 divided by, that would be 6200, which would be a gain of about 0.24. So let's see what happens. So with 1500 ohms, 0.24, and as R5 rises, it gets larger and eventually as R5 gets very large, it closes in on one. It does show the expected behavior. So far, so good. Now let's try the case where R3 is almost zero, where R2 plus R3 then total 100K. We expect the voltage gain to be R plus R5 over R5, which for R5 of 1500 ohms, would give us a gain of about 4.13 volts per volt. Let's try it, and there it is. Our expectations are valid again. And notice as R5 gets larger, the voltage gain converges towards unity. So let's sum this up. The gain is one if R2 equals R3, independently of the value of R5. The gain is minimized, it'll be less than one, if R2 is zero, and it will be maximized if R3 is zero. Okay. And the gain goes to unity as R5 goes to infinity, regardless of the values of R2 and R3. Okay. So the graphic equalizer though, needs to be able to boost or cut gain in a certain range of frequencies while showing unity gain outside of that range. So how do we do that? So here's how we can do it. Let's put R5 in series with an inductor and a capacitor. This branch is now a series resonant LRC circuit. And at the frequency at which the inductive reactants and the capacitive reactants are equal and opposite, series resonance, the branch will look purely resistive and will look like the value of R5 outside of that, or away from that series resonant frequency, the impedance of this branch will get to be much larger, okay? And this branch with these components shown should exhibit a resistance of 1500 ohms at 109 Hertz. And here is a simulation of that circuit as uh, was on the previous slide. The yellow trace here is the gain with R2 equals R3, neither boost nor cut. And you see it's zero decibels. That's unity gain. The red trace is gain with R2 equals zero, which is approximately zero, a milliohm, which is the greatest cut. A gain decrease at the peak, at the negative peak here of about minus 12 decibels. And with R3 approximately zero, which gives us the greatest boost we get, approximately 12 decibels gain.
works. It's beautiful. Fits the theory. So I can do a five band graphic equalizer using these series resonant circuits. Here's one that's resonant 109 hertz, one at 346, 1.09, 3.46 kilohertz, 10.9 kilohertz. And if I simulate this circuit with LT Spice, here's with all the potentiometers at boost, here's zero decibels or unity gain, goes up to peaks of around 13, a little over 13 decibels. There is some ripple in the gain versus frequency because of the overlap of the frequency ranges of each band. Here's all cut. And the solid yellow trace is the magnitude gain. And you can see it drops down to a minimum of about minus 13 and a half decibels. Okay. And here I've chosen to have the base boost, the two lowest frequency bands at maximum boost, the middle band at unity gain, and the treble, the two highest frequency ranges at maximum cut. You can see the frequency response, the magnitude of the frequency response. All of these plots are from 1 hertz to 100 kilohertz. But those inductors have problems. Inductors are practically available in fewer values in resistors or capacitors. Inductors tend to be bulky and are usually not readily available in a surface mount form for compact implementation. Inductors are usually more expensive than capacitors or resistors. Inductors that have ferrite or iron cores can have significant core losses at higher frequencies, and inductors have losses associated with their wire. These losses represent resistive components that make the inductors non-ideal. They look to be inductors that also contain resistance. They're not perfect inductors. But so what can we do? Ah, despair not, for we are engineers and we can perform amazing feats. Behold the wizardry. And from this point on, we'll let the magician take over. You remember this circuit? We called it an emitter follower. Here's the input at the base. Here's the output at the emitter. It has a very large input resistance. The input resistance of the transistor itself goes to infinity. And it's in parallel with the 68K. So the input resistance of this voltage follower would be 68K. The output resistance is very low and the voltage gain is essentially unity. And remember that bypass capacitor? It was on the VCC pin. That will make this VCC line be, for AC purposes, a short circuit to ground. So here's the actual circuit with the bypass capacitor included and the 1200 ohm series resistor. Now we can replace this actual circuit for modeling purposes by a simplified circuit using a voltage controlled voltage source with the input resistance of 68K with a voltage control voltage source producing a gain of one and the 1200 ohm resistor in series. So this pin is equivalent of that. This pin is the equivalent of that. So what? So let's look at this circuit now. V1 here is a test voltage source. We're gonna use LT Spice to determine the current that's, that it's flowing in R2 and R1. The voltage control voltage source here models the voltage follower. The current that's delivered by the voltage source divides into two branches. There is Vx over R2, and there is Vn minus Vx, which I labeled this node by the way, Vx, divided by R1. The controlling input of the voltage control voltage source draws no current. So to try to explain how this works, let's do a qualitative explanation here first with phasers. We're going to start with voltage phasers, and I'll take V in as the reference. We'll call it as one volt at a phase angle of zero. Now, Vx, that is derived from an RC voltage divider, a high pass voltage divider that will produce a voltage which leads the input. And I'm going to say it's by some angle alpha. Vn minus Vx, 
is going to lag by betas. If I take V in and subtract from it Vx, I get this resultant. And you see it lags the input voltage. Okay, so keep this in mind. Now let's look at the currents. I've reproduced the voltage phasor V in at phase angle of one at a phase angle of zero for reference. The current that's flowing in R2 is Vx divided by R2. The current that's flowing in R1 is Vn minus Vx divided by R1. And R2 is much larger than R1, so this current phasor will be much longer than this one. The resultant current, I, is Vn minus Vx divided by R1 plus Vx over R2. That's what this magenta arrow, this magenta phasor represented. You notice that, um, okay, Vx, the current Vx over R2 leads by angle, by alpha Vn minus Vx lag, lags again by the angle beta. I'm ahead of myself here. But the sum of the two currents lags Vn by an angle, which I'm here calling gamma. And because it's lagging the input voltage, it can be, it has both an in-phase component, which looks resistive, and a 90 degree lagging component, which looks inductive. So that circuit looks to the voltage source as if it were a resistor and an inductor. Clever. There's no inductor there, but it looks like there's one. So now I've convinced you that this little clever circuit synthesizes an impedance that contains both a resistance and an inductive. Let's put some numbers on this. Let's start by writing two equations and then we'll solve for V in over I, which would be the input impedance of this circuit. So we have Vx is V in times J omega C one R two divided by one plus J omega C one R two. And we have the current here is V in minus Vx times one over R one plus J omega C one. So that's this current and V in minus Vx times the admittance of capacitor C1, J omega C1. So we get our current equation. And if you do the, the math, solving for the impedance, the apparent impedance of this network is this term, which is a synthetic resistance. That's the resistive component. And this is the inductive, uh, the inductive reactance and this is the apparent synthetic inductance of that circuit. So L synth, which I here, is the inductance in R synth. That will take the place of R5 in the resonant boost cut circuit. So now what you do is you choose C2 to resonate with L synth at the center of the frequency band. For the values of C1, R1, and R2 below, L synth at 109 hertz is 3.126 henrys. The required resonating capacitor for that frequency is 0.682 microfarad. And the synthetic resistance that we obtain from these component values is 1,269 ohms. So this circuit replaces the LR components of the frequency selective boost cut circuit. And here we still have the same capacitor C2 in each of those two circuits. Okay, so we're in business. So here's a LT spice plot of the impedance versus frequency of that LRC circuit using the synthetic inductance and resistance. And the impedance passes through a minimum value of 1,270 ohms at 109 hertz, phase angle of zero, meaning it's purely resistive. I think we've nailed both the series resonant frequency and the resistance of the LRC network at resonance. This seemed to be on the right track here. So here is a design of a first pass design that I did of the microphone graphic equalizer. And this is the design with bands from 300 hertz to three kilohertz.
the typical range of frequencies that we assumed in the human voice for communication purposes. Okay. Each bandpass center frequency starting at 300 hertz, the succeeding one is higher by a factor of 1.778 than the preceding one. That happens to be the fourth root of 10. So by the time I go one, two, three, four multiplications, my last center frequency is 10 times the first center frequency. So the reference design used the square root of 10 as the ratio between successive band free, um, center frequencies of successive bands, which is a factor of 3.16. The resonant Q in my design here is 3.16. The reference design uses a Q of 1.7 because these bands that are used in this design are narrower than the reference design I needed the quality factor or Q of the bandpass circuits to be somewhat higher. So this was a, an, at least an initial guess. And the center frequency in Hertz is one over two pi times the synthetic resistance times C2. And the quality factor of the resonant circuits is one over the synthetic resistance times the square root of the ratio of the synthetic inductance to resonating capacitor C2. Okay, so let's see how this thing works. Here it is, all boost. And this is a graph from 10 hertz to 10 kilohertz. And we're getting a boost that maxes out at somewhere around 13 decibels. Here's all cut. And we get the same reduction and, or a mirror image reduction, I should say. And here's base boost. Treble cut. I think we got it. So let's put the wraps on everything here. Once again, another mystery has been revealed and a new design has been created and all in all for an engineer, not a bad day's work. So anyway, appreciate the time you spent with us and Keep those cards and letters coming and we'll see you in future videos.